The peregrine falcon, the fastest animal in the world, with a speed of over 200 miles per hour, renowned for its strong hunting ability, athleticism and versatility, a powerful and formidable hunter able to catch smaller as well as much larger prey than itself. As a symbol, it dates back to the ancient Egyptians with the sun god Ra depicted with the head of the peregrine falcon and Horus, the god of kingship and the sky. It's been used in falconry, the art of hunting wild animals using trained birds of prey for well over 3,000 years and became a popular sport among nobles of Asia, the Middle East and medieval Europe, first arriving in Britain in the 9th century. A sport of nobles and the upper classes, as much as a status symbol due to the time and expense required to train the bird, as a sport and pastime. It reached its peak, or pitch, in the 17th century before the advent of shooting, which led to its inevitable demise. Falconry is a royal sport of princes, kings and queens. It is also the crest or cognizance of Shakespeare's coat of arms, answering the question, who is shaking the spear? Hello and welcome to the Speedy Dispatcher part one. My name is Glenn Alexander and thank you very much for watching this first part in this four part series exploring the Falcon. This is the funerary monument Shakespeare in Holy Trinity Church Stratford upon Avon. You'll see at the top of this monument we have our coat of arms with our falcon holding the spear upright. You'll also notice that Shakespeare is holding a quill. If you look at the top of the quill, the orientation of that quill is very similar to the spear going across the bend of that shield. Beneath we have our epitaph, which says, Stay, passenger, why goest by thou so fast? And our falcon is the fastest animal in the world. Quick nature. Olympus habits, the heavens have him. Leaves living art, which we'll see a little bit later. What does the falcon represent in coat of arms in heraldry? In heraldry, the falcon symbolises one who does not rest until the objective is achieved. It represents a person of action, eagerly pursuing something desired. The art of training falcons or hawks to pursue and attack wild fowl or game was often associated with kings and nobles in the royal sport of falconry, and it also quickly and swiftly dispatches the Shakespeare authorship debate. We're going to start with Hamlet, uh, someone who is all too familiar with uh, falconry, as we'll see in a second, but let's let's just start at the beginning. Who's there? Nay, answer me. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king, Bernardo. He. You come most carefully upon your hour. Now, Hamlet is quite familiar with falconry, and you can see this in Act 1, Scene 5, with the exchange between Horatio and Hamlet. Illo, ho, ho, my lord. Hello, ho, ho, boy, come, bird, come. That's a direct uh, falconry expression. Uh, so Hamlet, uh, the prince, is clearly quite familiar with falconry, but you can also see this, a nice picture of Hamlet as a bird there, uh, you can also see this in Act 2, Scene 2, you are welcome, but my uncle, father and aunt mother are deceived. In what, my dear Lord? I am but mad north, northwest, when the wind is southerly. I know a hawk from a handsaw. Well, the question is, do you know a hawk from a handsaw? Here's my favourite joke in Hamlet. Speak the speech, I pray you, as I pronounced it to you, tripping thee on the tongue. But if you mouth it, as many of your players do, I'd had as leaf the town crier spoke my lines. Nor do not saw the air too much with your hand thus, but use all gently from the very... Did you notice that? I wouldn't recommend sawing the air with your hand either. I'd recommend using a hawk, uh, but use all gently says Hamlet. And if we actually have a look at the book of Saints 
Aubens, 1486, unknown author, uh, otherwise called the Book of Hawking, Hunting and Heraldry. This is a hierarchy of hawks, um, which hawk goes for which rank. And you'll see for the prince, we have the falcon gentle or the tercet gentle. Use all gently, says Hamlet. Now, in Act 1, Scene 5, the ghost scene, um, I'm going to read through this. Uh, to prick and sting her, fare thee well at once. The glowworm, which you'll meet later, shows the martin to be near. Uh, and gins to pale, pale actually means to um, be upright. His unaffectual fire, adieu, adieu, Hamlet, remember me. O oh, all you host of heaven, O oh, earth, what else? And shall I couple hell, O oh, fie, hold my heart, and you my sinews grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee, ay, thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted globe. Remember thee, yea, from the table of my memory I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all pressures past that youth and observation copied there. Did you notice it? All sores of books. I know a hawk from a hand saw. Well, let's have a look at a saw of book. Here's a book, all to do with falconry. It's a very important book, which I'd encourage you to read by apparently George Turberville, gentleman, uh, in 1575. Uh, that's also where the picture I showed you before of Queen Elizabeth, who is out uh, hawking, um, out with her falcon, uh, which we'll look at a little bit later. So the contents of this book, a description of all kinds of hawks that are in use and their properties, the reclaiming, imping, mewing and fleeing both the field and the river of the same hawks. Their diseases and cures and all such special points as in any wise appertain to that most excellent and gentleman-like quality. Also a little treatise translated out of the Italian tongue touching the diseases happening to Spaniels with their cures. Um, now he references the names of the authors from whom he has collected um, this wisdom of falconry. Um, I struggled to find some of these authors, I'll be honest, but he does tell you um, where I must confess I have not translated verbatim and um, by word or line what I found. Uh, so then I had not dealt so exactly as I now have done. For that I found sundry things not so well agreeing to our humours and use, but have taken my pleasure of them in making choice of the chiefest matter which did occur in them, hoping the more my pains have been, the less shall be mine offence, and the greater the liking of the reader, and the better his acceptance, which, if I find both I for my travel, uh, shall think myself sufficiently guerdoned, and the careful printer deem both his cost and charge well employed, being meant to the benefit and pleasure of his native countrymen, whose avail he chiefly respecteth herein, and not any great advantage that shall privately fall out to him. Uh, he continues with a nice little um, poem here. If he that rides by book can make his horse do well, and he by book that makes his hawk may make his hawk excel, the hawk can flee as well by art, as horse by rule can play his part. Now, you might notice uh, some things here. Uh, in The Art of English Posy, one of the first things it does in this book is define the word poet. A poet is as much to say as a maker, and our English name well conforms with the Greek word for of Greek poem to make, they call a maker. And if you have a look at this short uh, poem, can make, makes his hawk, make his hawk. So if you work back to make is to be a poet, a maker. Now, he continues this with a four page poem. Now, I'm not going to read through uh, this four page poem for you. That's for your own leisure and pleasure. Uh, but I will give you some quick select highlights. 
Uh, so small a bird, so large a fowl, at such a lofty gate to reach and wrap and force to fall, it is a game of state. And so for head to slay the fowl, a noble sport to view, in my conceit no pleasure like to hawks, I tell you true. And more than that, the heart, it leaps and laughs for joy to think how such a slender hawk should cause so huge a fowl to shrink. Which, if it be so, then yield me thanks that beat my busy brow and took this tool for thine avail to teach thee when and how to work this practice and device, except the printer's pain who shows the sundry shapes of hawks, though little to his gain, both he and I can do no more than offer our good will, and all to further thy delight, and add until unto thy skill, which if we do we have the higher of both our meanings, then you cannot do a better deed than thank the painful man. Pain. Sundry shapes of hawks, his gain, delight. You cannot do a better deed than thank the painful man. And he does say unto me to be deciphered unto the reader. And hopefully by the end of this uh, series, this shall be deciphered for you. Uh, we then follow this with the induction or proem uh, to this discourse and treatise of Hawking, where he tells you that Hawking is... Uh, as in uh, other things, an art and a science of any matter concerning falconry to give the reader a perfect and absolute understanding both of his conceit and of the knowledge of the thing. Hawks, the better to decipher the special nature of each one hawk in his own proper kind, which otherwise were very hard to do by means of confusion of sundry names and terms as also the number of birds of prey then we uh, we go to number these uh, these birds of prey and you'll see that number four is the falcon so let's just explore let's get straight into the matter of the different sorts of falcons and the two most important uh, falcons he starts with are the falcon gentle and of the good shape of the Haggart falcon, or otherwise known as the Peregrine falcon. I quite like Haggart because it has the word art in it. Now, you may have noticed the book of St Albans that I showed you before the, the page, unfortunately, in uh, I think the Cambridge University Library was, um, was ripped. Uh, but luckily I managed to find you uh, a, a, a full page for you there. We've seen for prints, but use all gently. Uh, but for the peregrine falcon, um, that would be for an earl. So for an earl, uh, the correct hawk for that station would be the peregrine falcon. Um, if we have a look at the haggart or peregrine falcon, the haggart is an excellent good bird, but as my author affirmeth, very choice and tender to endure hard weather. But in mine own conceit, she is in nature far otherwise. And my reason is this, and she should be better able to endure colds than the falcon gentle, because she doth come from foreign parts, a stranger and a passenger, and doth win all her prey and meat at the hardest by main wing, and doth arrive in those parts where she is taken when the fowls do come in great flocks, which is the very hardest part of the year. Moreover, being a hot hawk by kind, she should the better sustain the force of weather, and that she is hot hawk of nature may be gathered by her flying to a high pitch, where I take to be for that, yada yada yada, and again she meweth with more expedition, so quickly, uh, if she once begin to cast her feathers, uh, then the other falcons do. But these points of controversy I leave to the learned and such as have the experience of the matter. Uh, we also say the most excellent birds of all other falcons are is the uh, peregrine falcon. 
where he goes through the where the etymology of where the name falcon comes from uh, but it it skilleth not much which of these three alleged is the true cause we will not stand upon that nice point for that a good falconer much more to regard the searching out of the true nature and property of hawks than to have so great and special respect unto their names and terms. First, the haggart is a larger hawk than the falcon gentle, and a uh, longer armed hawk, uh, being both very good falcons and the best of all other, both for the field and the river. But a long flight, the haggart is far the better of both, and doth excel all other kind of hawks, both for good wing and maintenance of her flight, which is a perfect proof of a very good back. Uh, he says a little hawk and a large tersel, that's the, the male uh, hawk, male peregrine falcon, is ever best, are more rare and passing in perfection. So uh, this was part one. Uh, in part two of the Speedy Dispatcher, which is probably the longest part in the series, uh, we're going to explain why the Sweet Swan of Avon take part in the forgotten sport of daring, stitch together a web and redefine Sonnet 91. I shall see you then. Thank you very much.